Hello everyone and welcome to Solution Development Tech Talk Extension. My name is Kuntal Ghoshal. I'm a senior solution architect with Fast Track for Dynamics 365 apps and common data services team. From objective point of view, today we will be talking about what are the different extensibility models available with Dynamics 365, different extensibility options and best practices. From this session, you will be able to learn different options available to extend Dynamics 365, learn different details around plugins, webhooks, client-side scripting, and understand best practices when you are extending Dynamics 365. As we start the session, we will quickly learn about extensibility options available with Dynamics 365 platform. Let us quickly talk about extensibility model. For long term Dynamics 365 users, the product had gone through evolution starting with Dynamics CRM 1.0 to Dynamics 365 customer engagement today. From a platform perspective, there is a change as well. App and platforms are separated with the recent releases. I will be using CDS or Dynamics 365 references throughout this presentation. CDS is the common data service platform. First party apps like sales, customer service, field services are deployed on it. CDS can be subscribed as a platform without installing any first party app like sales, customer service, or field service as well. As you can see in the diagram, Dynamics 365 platform provides extensions capacity in every horizontal layer. Business user can take the advantage of low code, no code platform by configuring business rules or power automate to meet their organization need. Developer can also take the advantage of .NET SDK for extending the platform to move, the, move meet their organizational need as well. Dynamics 365 provides rich API to connect for external line of business applications, as well as an option to use JavaScript for client side only changes. We will quickly check how Dynamics 365 SDK can be leveraged for complex development scenarios. If you are a long term Dynamics user, there is a change on the way the SDK is made available today. SDK and the related documentations are replaced by Developer Guide. Developer Guide is a part of docs.microsoft.com now and has all the needed documentations like Get Started connect with auth ADFS, use web services, extension like plugins, customization like forms views, or even if you are a pro developer, .NET SDK assemblies and some other, other common line tools are available through a software distribution website called NuGet. You can also use PowerShell script or Visual Studio to download the NuGet packages. You can download the tools only for development usage, like plugin registration tool by using um, PowerShell script. The tools available for download from NuGet.org uh, are core generation, configuration migration utility, package deployer, plugin registration, and solution packager. With that, we will now check how Dynamics 365 platform provides detail about developer resources. If you navigate to settings, customizations, uh, developer resources, Dynamics 365 provides the details around how a developer can start extending the platform with developer resources. It also provides options about organization specific details like organization ID and unique name. Each organization have a separate unique organization GUID and a name. This instance reference is helpful when you will be extending your organization. Web API and organization services detail. Organization specific services details for connecting to external applications or processes or tools. These are shop and rest endpoints, which we will be talking later in the presentation. Discovery services uh, API reference to provide a way to discover which server is serving an instance at a given time. We will quickly check the different options to connect with web services in the, in the next slide. The customer engagement web API provides a development experience that can be used across a wide variety of programming languages, platforms, 
or devices. The Web API implements the OData or Open Data Protocol version 4.0 and OSC standard for building and consuming RESTful APIs over rich data sources. You can learn more about this protocol from www.odata.org. Details about these standards are also available at the oasis.open.org uh, uh, um, website. The Web API should be your first choice for new development that will support Dynamics 365 customer engagement. Eventually, the Web API will replace the organization service and organization data service, but both of these existing web services will be available to enable a gradual transition to a single Web API. Let us talk about SOAP Endpoint the organization service. The organization service has been available since Dynamics CRM 2011. It's the web service that most developers working with Dynamics 365 customer uses. The organization service is optimized for use with .NET. There are a set of .NET assemblies and tools to allow you to generate strongly typed classes and proxies that streamline. Please remember, the .NET assemblies for the organization service currently uses a 2011 SOAP endpoint, which has been deprecated. The SDK assemblies will eventually be migrated to internally use the Web API instead of the 2011 Web SOAP endpoint. With that, we will check how you can connect to Dynamics 365 using Web API. For connecting Web API, OAuth is the authentication standard. First of all, client application, which will be connecting to Web API, must support the use of OAuth to access data using the Web API. After users provide credentials to authenticate, OAuth determines whether they are authorized to access the resources. Client applications must support the use of OAuth to access data using the Web API. OAuth enables two-factor authentication or certificate-based authentication for server-to-server -server application scenarios. OAuth requires an identity provider for authentication. For common data service or Dynamics 365 customer engagement, the identity provider is Azure Active Directory or AAD. To authenticate with AAD using a Microsoft Work or School account, use the Azure Active Directory authentication uh, libraries for JavaScript or ADAL.js. Uh, we will quickly walk through on connecting Web API from an external application. If you want to get more details around this walkthrough, please go to the link that's mentioned uh, on, the, on the presentation and you can get uh, detailed step-by-step -step guidance on um, what are the stages required to use uh, to retrieve the data from Dynamics 365 using a Web API. We will quickly go through uh, the detail uh, around, around displaying um, the data from Dynamics 365 to Web API by registering and configuring the simplest single page application or SPA. When you connect using OAuth, you must first register an application in your Azure Active Directory tenant. You need an app with Azure Active Directory registered to connect with Dynamics 365 you need to grant the access Dynamics 365 as organization users permission. And this application that you will be using to access a specific detail from Dynamics, it needs to be bound to a specific user account. Also, you must configure a secret for the app registration or upload a public key certificate. Let us quickly talk about some of the prerequisite to connect to Web API. You must have a common data service system user account with administrator role for the Office 365. You must have an Azure subscription to register your application. A trial account will also work. Definitely, you need Visual Studio for uh, development. And when you complete this walkthrough, you will be able to run a simple uh, SPA application in Visual Studio, which will provide the ability for a user to authenticate and retrieve data from common data service. Another quick point to mention, Active Directory Authentication Library for JavaScript or ADL.js helps you to use Azure AD for handling authentication in your single page applications. Microsoft is also investing on Microsoft Authentication Library for JS or MSAL.js. Any new development should leverage MSAL.js. There is also a migration path to migrate from ADL to MSAL. 
We will now check other options to extend, extend the CDS platform. The first option we will be talking about is plugin. A plugin is a custom business logic that you can integrate with Dynamics 365 customer engagement to modify or augment the standard behavior of the platform. Another way to think about plugins is that they are handlers for events fired by Dynamics 365 customer engagement. You can subscribe or register a plugin to a known set of events to have your code run when the events occur. Data operations in the common data service platform are based on messages and every message has a name like create, retrieve, retrieve multiple, update, delete, like that. When you use plugin registration tool to associate an ex extension with a particular message, you will register it as a state. The We will be having some screenshot uh, later in the presentation where we will be displaying how you can do that. Plugin can execute either sync or async. Async workflow will always uh, starts after plugin execution completed. Uh, this is just a useful tip to remember. With that, we will quickly move to event execution pipeline. The event execution pipeline processes events either synchronously or asynchronously. The platform core operation and any plugins registered for synchronous execution are executed immediately. Synchronous plugins that are registered for the event are executed in a well-defined order. Plugins registered for asynchronous executions are queued by the asynchronous queue agents and extended at a later time by the asynchronous service. Let us quickly check the event execution stages of a plugin pipeline. Pre-event or pre-validation, which is the stage 10. At this stage in the pipeline for plugins, this actually execute outside the database transaction. So for example, if you want to do a pre-validation when um, you do not want the database transaction to happen, you can use this step to register your plugin. There are several business cases um, that can be achieved through that. For example, you want to check your business data that the user entered data against some validation, maybe if the phone number is correct, though that no, that's, can be achieved through JavaScript as well. Sometimes some customer have a strict requirement that they want to have the server side logic as well to validate whether the user had entered a correct phone number or a correct email address. On those, uh, on those particular scenarios, you do not need the plugin to execute on the database after the database transaction starts. Rather, you can do those validation even before the database transaction had started by registering your plugin on the pre-validation or stage 10. Pre-event or pre-operation or stage 20. This stage in the plugin are actually executed within the database transaction. So if you want to do some pre-validation with an user entered data, let's say if uh, entered data you want to compare against something that's inside the platform, you can have this registered in the pre-operation or stage 20. You can also uh, throw an exception from this stage, and in that case, the plugin transaction will not be committed or the plugin will not be executed further. And your um, operation, depending on um, the type of the plugin, your operation will not be completing. Platform core operation or main operation, which is in stage 30. This uh, particular stage, this is a system defined and uh, Dynamics 365 platform do not support custom plugin to be registered in this stage. This is purely for internal use. The post event or post operation of stage 40, stage in the pipeline for plugin, which are to execute after the main operation. Plugin registered in this stage, executed within the database transaction. Sometimes you want to compare what had been done after, after the record is created or updated and take additional business action. Let's say on create of an account, you want to check something on the child account or associated contact record, or you want to do some further business operation inside the CDS platform. One of the key criteria for this sort of scenario is your primary record 
create or update uh, operation to be completed. So those can be registered in the post event. Please remember post event also happens within the same transaction. So if um, your your transaction is failure uh, at some point, then the entire entire transaction will be rolled back and your record will not be saved. With that, we will quickly move on um, creating a plugin. We will um, get through some of the high level detail. We will not talk about uh, great detail about uh, how you create a plugin. Um, there are doc site, but uh, this the idea will be to give you an overall idea of the prerequisite when you create a plugin. All plugin operations that occur in the system are ultimately instances of the organization request class being processed by the iOrganizationService.execute method. A service is initiated and organizationService.execute executes the custom business logic inside Dynamics 365 plugin. Let us quickly talk about what you need to create a plugin. You need a class library. You need to install Microsoft.CRM SDK dot core assemblies from NuGet packages. You need to implement the iPlugin interface by editing the class. You need to sign the plugin. That's one of the requirements to sign uh, that assembly. And again, you need to deploy uh, the plugin using plugin registration tool. You also need to uh, register a step. We'll talk a little bit uh, around the step uh, going forward, um, but from a plugin um, standpoint, when you are executing a plugin, always implement tracing for easy debugging of your plugin. This is one of the um, developer tips. If you have a tracing enabled at certain stages of your custom uh, business logic, if your plugin gets into some exception after it is deployed, it will be really easy to check what happened or at which stage your plugin is, is failing. You can always go to system settings, customization, plugin and custom workflow activity tracing, and you can check your trace log, um, what, whatever you had written. So plugin tracing enable uh, zero, one or two um, when, you are, when you are actually writing a tracing. Zero is for uh, no tracing will be written, one is for exception only, and two is for all or verbose. One quick tip, do not enable tracing um, all or, or two when you are deploying a plugin on your production. The reason behind is it will consume a lot of resources um, and can affect your server performance. With that, um, we will quickly talk about uh, the the plugin uh, registration tool, the plugin steps. So this is the um, plugin registration tool. This is um, the, if you can see here, um, this is where we are selecting register new assembly. We are selecting our assembly and basically we are saying whether the isolation mode of the plugin is sandbox um, and uh, we are also saying where exactly the, the plugin will be, uh, will be uh, stored so in in online it only will be stored uh, in the database and uh, the isolation mode will be sandbox let us quickly talk about uh, the plugin steps when you register a step for a plugin that includes an entity as one of the parameters you have the option to specify that a copy of the entity data to be included as snapshot or image using pre entity image or post entity image properties some of the uh, step uh, that you need to take when you are when you are registering a um, when you are working with the plugin some of the considerations that you you can you can consider that you cannot have a pre-image for the create message because the entity doesn't exist um, to have a pre-image. You cannot have a post image for the delete message because the entity won't exist anymore. You can only have a post image for steps registered in the post operation stage of the execution pipeline because there is no way to know what the entity properties will be until the transaction is completed. For an update operation that is registered in the post operation stage, you can have both a pre-image and a post image. Filtering attribute for update plugin. This is very, very important. Filtering attribute actually determine when that plugin will be triggered. So always uh, mention filtering attribute when you are registering a plugin for update. We will talk uh, more about filtering attribute uh, in the in the coming slides when you when you talk about best practices. 
With that, we will talk about another um, important option, which is lately introduced in the platform to extend your Dynamics 365, Wavehooks. Wavehooks is a lightweight HTTP pattern for connecting web APIs and services with a public subscribe model. Wavehooks senders notify receivers about events by making requests to receive endpoints with some information about the events. Wavehook enables both synchronous and asynchronous step. One of the key benefits of using Wavehook is Wavehook sends post requests with JSON payload and can be consumed by any programming language or web application hosted anywhere. With this extension, carefully consider some of the some of the uh, best practices or consideration. You could use synchronous mode or asynchronous mode both for Wavehooks, but please use um, asynchronous mode unless you want your Wavehook to send the JSON payload immediately after the action is completed. There are other options to have uh, a Wavehook um, or uh, Azure uh, Service Bus integration or Azure Aware plugin. So Azure Aware plugin only um, allows for asynchronous steps, whereas um, Wavehooks um, allows both synchronous and asynchronous execution. And another important uh, feature of Wavehook, it can be invoked from a plugin or a custom workflow assembly. So this is the um, steps of registering a plugin, uh, registering a Wavehook. We are still um, using the, the plugin registration tool and then um, basically using the same tool, you register a Wavehook um, for, detail, <coughs> for detail step around registering the Wavehook please um, check the doc.microsoft.com websites, um, which list uh, all the detailed steps that you, you need to follow for registering the webhooks. Let us um, talk about Power App Component Framework, which is again lately introduced, but uh, very popular options to extend uh, Dynamics 365. So Microsoft vision um, is to empower every person and organization in this planet to achieve more. Power App, <coughs> sorry. Power App Component Framework or PCF is built with that in mind. PCF enables every developer to do more with citizen developer to take advantage of low code, no code platform and pro dev to develop complex requirements. There are a number of community driven websites which can provide ideas on endless possibilities that can be achieved through PCF. Quick uh, reminder, even though we are transitioning from classic web client to unified interface, PCF is only available with uh, unified client interface. We will now quickly explore some of the more detail with Power App Component Framework or PCF. As we mentioned, PCF empowers developers or app makers to create code components for model driven and canvas app. Access to a rich set of framework APIs that expose capabilities like component lifecycle management, contextual data, and metadata. Some of the important benefits of having a PCF are optimizes, uh, PC, PCF is optimized uh, for performances, reusability of PCF's code component, and again, it um, supports the developer to bundle all files into a single solution file. That's also immensely helped when you are moving a PCF control across your different environment. We will quickly discuss uh, how PCF is different than um, classic web resource approach. So if you are a long-term Dynamics user or developer, you must have used a web resource to display certain information um, in, a, in a format that your organization wants or to integrate even um, from external services um, using an iframe. So unlike HTML web resources, code components are rendered as a part of the same context in PCF, load at the same time as any other components, providing a seamless experience for the user. Developer can bundle all the HTML, CSS, and TypeScript files into a single solution package file and move across environment and also shift via, via app source. And finally, code component can be reused many times across different entities and forms. Use Power Apps component framework to create code component that can be used across full breadth of Power Apps capability. 
We will quickly talk about Power Automate, uh, which typically we use to call Flow. So Power Automate is a service that helps to create automated um, workflows, and Power Automate can be created uh, against an event which is triggering in Dynamics 365 or some other services which then perform an action inside Dynamics 365 or some other service action from Dynamics 365. One of the key benefit of using Power Automate is it is very tightly coupled with Dynamics 365. You can create a Power Automate. You can, you can have that triggering from Dynamics 365 itself, and you can have the access of all the events straight into the Power App, um, straight into the Power Automate from uh, about Dynamics 365. One quick recommendation, um, which we'll again talk about, um, when you are using, um, when you are creating a classic workflow, we always recommend that instead of creating a classic workflow, please create um, a Power Automate uh, to do the similar job. So um, the below screenshot uh, actually shows uh, the Power Automate. If you can look at it, uh, this particular Power Automate, it creates a child account when an account is created. So if you, if you look at it, uh, it shows the current environment and entity name is account, scope is organization. Again, you can, um, you can change the scope depending on the level of access you want to give to this Power Automate. When you create a new record, what it is actually <coughs> what it is actually saying is when an account record is created on the current environment, you again create an account record and you can access the fields that's been created on the parent account and you can use formulas to have those fields coming together and basically um, have them available in the, in the next step of that Power Automate. So if you can see the example here, we are creating another child account by concatenating some of the fields that's coming from the parent account. With that, we will talk about um, another important aspect of embedding a Canvas app um, into, um, into Dynamics 365 model-driven app. Canvas apps are embedded in model-driven model forms in the same way other custom controls are added. An embedded Canvas app includes rich data integration capabilities that brings in contextual data <coughs> from the <coughs> sorry from the host model-driven form to the embedded Canvas app. Um, Canvas app also provides a what you see, what you get kind of a designer, which um, you can take full advantage. It has also uh, have a capability to connect over 200 data sources um, through its native connector. And a uh, couple of consideration here. Um, we when you were uh, when you were choosing between um, having the data coming through Canvas app into a model driven form or a Power App uh, or Component Framework or PCF, uh, PCF from a performance standpoint might be performing better considering um, the, the code component and the HTML and CSS rendering together um, inside the form. Whereas uh, on the Canvas app, because it is an external component that you are embedding in your model driven form, the performance can be slightly slower. So that's a that's a very important consideration you need to keep in mind. On the other hand, PCF requires uh, some pro developer skill or development skill, whereas Canvas app uh, are for citizen developer can take the full advantage of Canvas app and build those Canvas app using the default connectors available. So uh, on both sides, there are pros and cons. So when you are evaluating whether to, to have a PCF control or whether to use a Canvas app, choose um, carefully and consider all the different aspects. So this is uh, uh, an example of uh, a Canvas app used in a model driven form. So as you can see here, this is an account form and on the right hand side, <coughs> sorry, on the right hand side, we are actually showing um, a Canvas app being displayed inside the model driven form. So the context informations are actually built in a Canvas app and embedded inside the model driven account form. With that, we will quickly talk about client side scripting. 
client side scripting using javascript is one of the ways to apply custom business process logic for displaying data on a form in dynamics 365 customer engagement it can be used to balance the load between client and server supported script can be written for multiple client including mobile and web client and can be used to control the end user experience we will um, quickly check uh, what are the uh, client side scripting events so below are uh, the the in model driven apps you associate a specific function in a javascript library to be executed when an event occur this function is called event handler each event handler specifies a single function within a javascript library and the parameters that can be passed to the function events occur in in customer engagement forms and grids whenever a form or grid loads data is changed <coughs> or saved you execute your javascript code by associating it an e to an events so that it is executed when the event occurs <coughs> apologies with that let us quickly talk about object model The client API object model for model driven apps provides you objects and methods that you can use to apply custom business logic in model driven apps using JavaScript, such as get or set attribute values, show and hide user interface element, reference multiple controls per attribute, access multiple forms per entity, manipulate from uh, navigation item, or interact with the business process flow control. There are uh, the, the following uh, root objects in, in client API, as you can see on the, on the slide, execution context, which represents the execution context, context for an event in model-driven apps, um, forms, and grids. Form context, which provides a reference to a form or an item on the form against which the current code executes. To get the form context object, you can use execution context dot get form context method grid context provides a reference to a grid or a subgrid on a form against which the current code executes and xrm context which provides a global object for performing operation that do not directly impact the data and ui informs grid subgrids control or attributes it's important that you understand the model driven apps client API object model to effectively write and use your JavaScript code in Dynamics 365 customer engagement. You must remember to select the pass execution context as first parameter in the event handler properties when you are defining um, against a form context object. Just a quick uh, reminder, use of the XRM.page object as a static access to the Primary form context is still supported, but it is deprecated. We are still supporting it to maintain backward capabilities and compatibility with the existing script, but we recommend that you use the form context object instead of the XRM.page object for any new development. Also, gradually, if you have uh, existing development, you should plan to change um, it to use um, form, context, form context from XRM.page. With that, we will uh, start the next part of the presentation, which is best practices. Now, as you understand, Fast Track is engaged um, with, with uh, a number of global uh, top tier customers accounts implementation, and uh, we derived these best practices based on our experience working with those top tier customer. We will um, quickly go through those best practices um, so that you can also imbibe them and uh, avoid some of the common challenges that we have seen in, in uh, some execution or some implementation from customer. First of all, performance. So when you are using a custom code, it is very important to have the column set, no lock, and page info options used in the query expression. So as you can see in the code here, we had uh, this query option where we can also have um, the column set set as blank in that case, in which case it will retrieve the entire column set from that entity. 
which might not be required for my execution. So it is always recommended that when you are writing a query expression, you always specify the column set and um, provide only the provide only the columns that you require for that execution. Also, please specify no lock equals true so that uh, the platform doesn't need to doesn't need to lock um, still your execution gets completed. Page info and page number are also very important when you are retrieving a large set of data so that you can use uh, a custom logic to retrieve the number of page or the count of the record when you are writing your custom code. With that, we will go to the next section of performance. Sometimes we have seen that uh, when you are executing your custom code, a number of uh, customer uses uh, a, a web service, single web service call. With uh, Dynamics 365, you can always have uh, a batch request sent. Even though when you send a batch request at the server side or when the request reaches Dynamics 365, it will be processed uh, as first in first, uh, uh, like a one at a time or um, in a queue itself, but consider the network latency impact. So if you are, uh, let's take an example that you need to process around 500 uh, create record inside Dynamics 365. If you're sending 500 record in a single web service call, you are actually making 500 round trip and that can have, a, have, a, have an impact on the network latency um, for, for um, your performance and for your create operation. Rather, you can have five batch created with 100 um, size of each batch is being 100, or you can create even uh, the batch supports till 1000, but we don't recommend uh, having 1000 uh, put together as one single batch, but you can also create uh, a custom batch size, and then you can send a fewer request and avoid uh, this network latency and have a fewer round trips when you are using a web service call. Just one quick uh, reminder here. Uh, if you are using execute multiple uh, from a server side event like plugins, it doesn't have uh, much of an impact uh, even if you are using a batch. Reason behind is the code itself is executing on the server. So the next uh, important, uh, I, I would rather say very important uh, best practice we're going to talk about is keep alive. If a plugin makes external web request and is trying to use keep alive on a closed connection, the plugin will ultimately fail to execute the web request. If the plugin is registered synchronously, user may experience that unresponsive uh, of web browser or the browser itself stops responding. On an asynchronous side, it is uh, it is like uh, the the operation will eventually the plugin will fail, but definitely the user will uh, not be notified when when that failed. Uh, that depending on how that asynchronous job will be picked up. So default value for keep alive is true. Please make sure that uh, you make it to false if you are calling an external web service from your plugin or an external web reference from your plugin. The next thing we will be talking about on plugin execution, um, the plugin uh, 36, Dynamics 365 cast the plugin executions so that if you request a plugin in a certain time limit, it can actually serves a, lum a number of parameters from the cache itself rather than going to the server and retrieve them again. So object is not disposed. If you are planning to use a global variable within the plugin, it is not thread safe. So do not use uh, or declare global variable. You can use a static variable and uh, the reason behind of using static variable, they will be disposed uh, by the app domain. So using of static variable is uh, definitely uh, a, a, a practice that uh, some of our customers adopted. We have also seen uh, this global variable being passed through so that the value is passed across different plugin, but we always recommend uh, do not use um, the, the global variable inside a plugin. 
this is uh, one of the one of the uh, massive uh, impact uh, best practice. So if you are having a plugin that is registered on an update and you do not have a filtering attribute, what eventually will happen is any update that's been triggered for that particular entity, your plugin will be executed. For an example, let's say for account update, you want to capture if that update is happening only on the account name change or if there is a change on that account address or the country or city like a specific attribute on that entity itself so you what you can define when you are registering a plugin you can actually provide filtering attribute so that the update plugin will only be triggered when those uh, those attribute will be changed rather than triggering that plugin um, for every every update of that particular entity. So that will also help reducing the the number of uh, update being triggered on an entity. Number of uh, update plugin will is triggered on that particular entity. Exception handling. When you are writing a plugin, always use invalid plugin execution exception. So that is the recommended class to report exceptions in plugins and custom workflow. And uh, if you are using invalid plugin execution exception, it actually provides the required uh, user interface when that report uh, error uh, or exception is reported back to uh, end user as well. You can throw that exception back. Eye tracing service and plugin profiler. Um, if you are using um, I. We, we kind of discussed it earlier as well. If you uh, are deploying a plugin, it is always recommended that you uh, initiate an instance of the eye tracing service and uh, put your custom tracing there. The values are 0, 1, 2. 0 is for no tracing, 1 is for only exception tracing, and 2 is for all verbose kind of log. The reason behind um, having I, uh, this tracing enabled when you have a very complex business logic, you can have this tracing enabled on every major steps being accomplished. So that will also help you when you are debugging. That will also help you to understand at which stage your plugin has failed. Plugin profiler, another important uh, concept. If you if you want to um, deploy debug your plugin, which is deployed on the online environment, it doesn't give you the environment access because Dynamics 365 is a SaaS application. So you can use the plugin profiler to basically download your operation, attach it to your Visual Studio, um, load that particular uh, assembly, and then debug uh, that particular uh, plugin um, based on uh, to understand um, where exactly it, it kind of failed. Couple of uh, best practice on exception handling. Do not catch uh, generic exceptions, like uh, sometimes we have seen the practice of catch exception EX, which will eventually catch everything, every exception happening. Rather, you can have a very customized uh, exception. You can create a base exception class. You can derive your custom exception for your, from your base exception class. Uh, and eventually, you can use invalid plugin execution exception to have that uh, exception thrown back. But uh, on a practice perspective, do not use a generic exception catch. Implement the catch block appropriately. So if if uh, sometimes for a large um, business um, operation um, being executed, you might be placing only one catch uh, exception. So it is always recommended that you have a multiple separate catch block so that you can catch that exception at multiple different levels. Let's quickly talk about code optimization. So this is one of the practice that we have seen uh, from a number of customer where the customer complained, my uh, my system performance is really, really slow. Or when I uh, log in um, or, and try and access the account form, the account form takes a long time to load or any other form in that matter. So typically what sometimes happens, our developer, um, who implemented that uh, business logic from customer end, they might have used a synchronous um, call to retrieve <coughs> a large set of data to display on that, on that record load. So if you have a similar situation, your form load is actually waiting 
for your custom synchronous script to retrieve data or to perform particular operation. So avoid synchronous call using JavaScript specifically on the form load um, event where it directly impact the performance of the load. Synchronous XML HTTP request um, is deprecated. Uh, so if you if you um, require uh, if you have a synchronous XML HTTP request, <coughs> you might <coughs> you might need to revisit. Uh, apology, you might need to revisit that um, uh, that XML HTTP request because um, it is it is still supported, but uh, it's deprecated. Always uh, from a best practice perspective, use the XML HTTP um, asynchronous mode um, when, are, when you are using XML HTTP and then use XRM.web API um, when you are retrieving using JavaScript or when you are performing any operation, which is always async. So we also provided a sample example um, of using XRM Web API to create a record. And in that case, even if we didn't mention that uh, we need this particular operation to be async, the nature of uh, XML uh, XRM.Web API is async. Power App Solution Checker. So this has uh, been introduced um, quite lately, but uh, it was it was on a preview for a long time. Um, it's it's kind of uh, generally available now. So Power App Solution Checker performs a rich static analysis check of uh, of your solution against the best practices rules that's been defined, um, and quickly it can give you a report to identify any problematic pattern or anything that you might have missed um, in your in your um, custom development that can have like plugin or custom workflow activity or web resource or even um, configuration like SDK messaging steps. So um, we always recommend, even if you are using some sort of application lifecycle management, please use uh, Power App Solution Checker as a part of it so that it can be automated when you are doing um, uh, 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 application lifecycle management uh, using Azure DevOps or any other tool um, you prefer to choose. So Power App Solution Checker, um, in, in real world scenario, you can run it through um, your, your uh, Power Platform Admin Center. Um, you can choose the solution or you can even run on um, that. If you have a default solution, you can run on top of the default solution. This is how uh, the example of a Power App uh, Solution Checker being run. So you can see here um, it's a demo solution that uh, we have here on the uh, on the portal, and uh, we are just choosing uh, the Solution Checker to run. It's been enabled uh, by default, so you don't need to do anything. You just need to click on your custom solution and run it to validate it against uh, any sort of best practices that that's defined by Microsoft. Some of the top of mind in terms of uh, best practices. Always check uh, deprecation announcement uh, when you are starting your development. This is one of the key ex um, aspect that we try and uh, enforce our developer community or our customer and partner that uh, please um, take it as one of your checklist item. We have had uh, multiple scenarios um, where uh, the customer or the partner didn't even know that something is deprecated. For example, uh, forms broke um, and voice of customer. When voice of customer was deprecated, even though it is deprecated, um, there were new implementations happening because uh, the, the customer was not aware of the deprecation and uh, they were not using forms pro. Similarly, we have seen a number of occurrences of using XRM.page object model rather than using uh, the new form context. So always uh, keep it as a checklist item to regularly check uh, the, the uh, deprecation announcement uh, and roadmap website so that you are aligned um, with, with uh, the latest deprecation announcement. When you are creating an async workflow, always create uh, choose to have a power automate instead of an async workflow. Um, the reason behind uh, the, the async workflow um, are there for a long time and it's always um, we have a number of users uh, or customers organization which have async workflow, but uh, the way async workflow 
process uh, a request is uh, significantly different than how Power Automate process a request. So from a performance stability uh, standpoint, um, as well as extensibility standpoint, Power Automate provides a much better option than async workflow. It also provides uh, some of the latest uh, changes uh, into Power Automate uh, where you need to actually, you need to do a number of uh, steps into um, your classic workflow, or even you might have to do um, custom workflow assembly to achieve that. So always check that and use Power Automate instead of uh, using classic uh, async workflow. Sometimes uh, you have uh, custom um, or you have workflow which is a nested workflow or sometimes you have plugins in uh, in the in the platform registered and uh, without knowing um, the plugin is actually having exception. Sometimes uh, the uh, the developer is not monitoring if the plugin or workflow is actually hitting the max step. So always remember um, when you are using some sort of recurrence, if there is an error coming, you should check the max depth um, and you should terminate the execution of your plugin or, or workflow uh, or custom workflow assembly um, before the max depth to avoid any sort of performance implication. Let us quickly talk about uh, the entitlement limit. To ensure consistent availability and performance for everyone, we apply some limits on how our APIs are used. These limits are designed to detect when client applications are making extraordinarily demands and CDS returns an error indicating that too many requests have been met. If web API is used, the platform will return a 429 or too many request error with the organization service or, or um, with the SOAP endpoint, the CDS will return organization service fault error. Service protection API limit uh, are enforced based on <coughs> three parameters. The number of requests uh, which were sent by a user, the combined execution time was required to process requests sent by an user, the number of concurrent requests sent by a user. You could send fewer requests by bundling them in batch operations to bypass combined execution time limit. You could also send a large number of concurrent requests within the five minute sliding window before service protection API limits are enforced to bypass concurrent request limit. So these are uh, some of the numbers that um, we, we provided on uh, on a five minutes uh, sliding window that you should be you should be taking care of when you are specifically the service protection API uh, kicks in when you are doing a data migration and sometimes you will be getting a lot of uh, these four to nine uh, too many request error or or if you're using SOAP organization service port error. One way to um, avoid it is if you if you are sending the batch request for data migration, um, definitely check our data migration tech talk for best practices, but definitely um, for data migration or sort of integration to avoid this error, always um, determine a sweet spot with optimal settings of batch and parallel thread so that you can avoid some of those uh, some of these um, API limits being kicked in or service protection API limit being kicked in. Let us quickly also talk about capacity entitlement to help uh, NCR service level availability and quality. There are entitlement limit um, which which limits the number of requests user can make each day across model driven apps in Dynamics 365, such as Dynamics 365 cells or customer service power apps or power automate. If any user exceeds their request capacity, the admin for the tenant or environment will be notified. Users won't be blocked from using the app or occasional uh, for occasional or reasonable out outrages um, overuse it at this point of time. But please check uh, the the detail around that in our doc website so that you are always uh, compatible with uh, your implementation. With that, thank you for attending this session. Hope you have enjoyed it. Have a great time ahead.